and you know that introduction theme, and you hadn't heard it quite that far before, that is Kroll's Banjo and Fiddle with Nadja Salerno Sonnenberg. And I have two lovely ladies with me this morning, one of whom is a welcome back. Her name is Lisa Miller, and she is a part of Amphore Publishing, and she's... Well, give us your official title, Lisa. Um, I'm the business and marketing manager at Amphora, um, and I'm so glad to be back. It's wonderful to see your face again and be back in the studio. Well, it's wonderful to have you back with us, and you have a friend with you today who's also one of your authors, and a lovely lady by the name of Carol Swarthout Klein. Thank you. Delightful Good to, be here, to meet you. Yeah, it's lovely to be here. Well, you just have really impressed me, and w- the reason you have is not only because of meeting you today personally, but also your book that you wrote about the Ferguson episode. Uh, and I, I use the word episode because it really is a whole. Uh, <laughs> more than just the one chapter or the title. We're really going into the whole thing today here. And you took the paintings and the artists and uh, sort of wrote a book for children about this healing property. And I'm going to use a quote from your book, and it is actually from Kelly, a Ferguson res- resident. It says, While my group was painting a mural, a mother and her young son pulled over and asked if she could take a picture of her son in front of it. As she left, tears of joy rolled down her face as she told the whole group, Thank you. That brief moment is how I will forever remember the aftermath of Ferguson. Mm-hmm. That's that's really tremendous. And you have written this book addressing this primarily to children, but it's for children of all ages in many ways, too. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. And uh, it's just really a fascinating story because for every thing that happens there is always how do you react and as a resident of Ferguson for 26 years I was born there grew up there was married there and you know as every all of us did we watched what was happening and just were in many ways in shock and Thanksgiving came and this was the week after the riots the riots the fires were on Monday And on Thanksgiving week, um, I went up on Small Business Saturday. I said to my husband, I said, look, I I don't know what we can do, but we can at least go and support the small businesses there. And while I was there, I witnessed this painting for peace action happen. So I didn't start it or instigate it. It was actually started by a couple of people. uh, Tom Halaska and Dana Sebastian Duncan were really the main cheerleaders behind it but it was a a grassroots effort it came from social media and in the course of the thanksgiving day weekend hundreds of volunteers and artists of all abilities and ages and races showed up and started transforming the boards that had blanketed the city streets Mm -hmm. and turned it into the most amazing gallery of art and it was. I saw this story, and having a journalism background, I said, well, th- I would love to tell this story somehow. And in doing so, I wanted to help the city as well. It's, it's really remarkable, and I love the way that you chose the medium of a poetic telling of the story. Well, I tend to like to write that way anyway, and I know that children, having worked with children a lot, you know, they love rhyme, and yeah. they love the Dr. Seuss type Uh, poetry, and certainly I'm nowhere in that category, but I know that that is something that really appeals to children. And well, and it appeals, like I said, to children of all ages, because when I saw this book, I that's right away I determined, okay, we're getting you in for an interview because (laughs) this is, and it's entitled Painting for Peace in Ferguson. Right. And uh, tell us about how you decided to approach uh, the whole thing. Well, that's where Lisa and Amphore comes in. (laughs) Okay. So um, I knew I wanted to help Ferguson. And I thought, you know, with with stars in my eyes, I said, well, if I write a book, I'll make all this money and I can (laughs) donate it back to Ferguson. And in fact, it has done quite well. But um, I didn't know how to get started. So the the first thing I did is I, I went to Subterranean Books, which is an independent bookstore in University City near where I live. And I said, who are some good local publishers? And he gave me the names of three folks. And 
Uh, one said, send me a proposal, I'll get back to you in a month. Another mm. never got back. And the third one said, let's have coffee on Monday. And so I met with uh, Lisa's Christy. partner, yes. Christy, showed her my kind of rough draft of a poem and some of the some of the cell phone photos I had shot. And yeah. she said, I'm in, let's go with it. Wow. Also, I should add over the weekend, I knew I wanted to do something. Again, not really having the idea clearly formed, but I called, I have because I have a background in kind of promotion and, and public relations, I called a couple of my friends who are professional photographers, or as I say, have really expensive cameras and know how to use them. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hey, what are you doing this Saturday? How about you come up to Ferguson and start snapping photos? So I got a library of like a thousand really great photos of how this was happening, the artists working on the pictures, the yeah. completed pictures, etc. And I think if I hadn't done that, none of this would have been archived. So that was really a, it, it was just a, a lightning strike moment. It was just something that I just said, well, I, I've yeah. got to do this. I, it's this really important story to tell. It truly is. And uh, to tell it, you know, from from your perspective, I think was we, actually you're not putting yourself into it at all. But what I'm saying is the fact that you were able to be the observer and take so much of this in. Right. And I think what's important to realize here is that this is not glossing over the issues that led to Ferguson, but rather it's showing the community taking the first steps towards healing. Mm -hmm. Because the reason this was so transformative and, and like the quote that you read, I mean, people were really moved as they both got involved and engaged or just witnessed what was happening. And I think the reason was it took this little town that, that had become sort of the scene of, of fear and despair and brought hope. And it also, for the people that were there, you know, they felt affirmed. I remember talking to a business owner of Ferguson Optical Shop where I got glasses back in the seventh grade and it's still around. <laughs> and he said, um, you know, they were losing like $30,000 a month. Wow. Um, in the period between August and November. And he said he, he had tears in his eyes because the next morning when he went to see what was going on, there were people already there cleaning up and helping him with the windows and everything. And he said, you know, this gives me the courage to continue. And I think that was what was so important about that moment. And I really feel we have to lift up those kinds of moments. So We do indeed. We do indeed. And I think, you know, it, it, that growth, that human spirit that shines through in this book is really remarkable. Right. I think, you know, the, the way that you were able to do this and stand back and observe and stay out of the way you know, you, there's, there's, it's not Carol. You just happen to be looking through Carol's eyes, but you're not trying to inject your own opinion. You're just being the observer. Well, I think I'm the, you know, in essence, the microphone, but it's really ah, the community's yeah. story. It yeah. was, it, this is to me a gift from the community to the community. And again, you know, I'm going to bring Lisa into the conversation because if it hadn't been for M4 a having the courage to say, yeah, we're in, let's go. Yeah. It wouldn't have happened, and it also wouldn't have gotten out so quickly. Okay. It was remarkable. Go ahead, please. Well, I want to do. I, I know Christy, uh, my my partner, is is listening in. So big uh, shout out to Christy for knowing something really good when she sees it, yeah. and she's absolutely phenomenal. Um, um, seeing quality work and also building relationships that are incredibly important going forward, um, or as we're building, as we're growing. I mean, she she knows how important these are. Um, she were I, Carol. I mean, you guys had several meetings on on how to put it together, the layout, how what the cover was going to look like. I mean, I think you and yeah, she and that, got into the trenches together on. And that, that was one of the important things. Like I said, I had the pictures, I had the idea, I had a rough draft, but I didn't even. I don't think I could have told you what an ISBN was <laughs> when I <laughs> when I got started. You know, I mean, I I had no idea. I mean, how do you get it into Amazon? How do you get it into Barnes and Noble? How do you, you know? And that's where. You know, having a hands-on local publisher really helped. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we were talking about earlier is, um, you know, there's sort of two approaches to getting published. You can either um, go with a national publisher and hope that their clout and their marketing arms will get you some um, distribution in all of the national stores, but it can take up to two years where you're marketing yourself and your little idea. First, you have to spend about a year to get an agent 
The publishers won't even talk to you without an agent. And then you have to spend about a year with that agent, who's now getting a cut of everything, <laughs> to go to a publisher. And then if out of the 5,000 books they're publishing that year, they may give you, you know, three weeks of attention. With a local publisher, it's kind of the flip side. So, you know, they were in at the beginning. They were big cheerleaders. I'm Christy even delivered books to some of the uh, local local bookstores. I think they're getting too big for that now, but at the time Still, they did that. And yeah. and you know, Sit just at tables at the at the farmers market at Tar Grove. That's yeah. right. And and you I know, we it. just you know, we worked together. We were kind of growing together actually. And then um but then you have to spend the two years sort of after the book's out. That's when the work really begins. Sure. Is getting the word out, you know, um, having lovely folks like you let us talk about the book on the radio. Yeah. You know, that's that's what you have to do. So um, either way, it's about two years of work. It's just you got to decide if you want to do it before or after. And if you do it before, there's no guarantee you'll be published. I think yeah. Car Carol understood early on, uh, either directly or intuitively, that, that this isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. Yes. That this is, this is going to be ongoing and for a long time. And you have to continue to find new ways to keep the discussion going you know at first it's the event and then it's the people and then it's it's the awards and then it you know cycles back um but you've always done a really good job of keeping keeping it moving sometimes fast sometimes slow but always moving always yeah. the discussion out there which is absolutely invaluable and something again that we we talk about with our other authors as well that this is this is a partnership. As a small publisher, we're not bringing to bear, you know, a, a giant marketing staff with this, you know, thousands of dollars marketing budget. But what we are bringing is we're partnering with you. You know, we, we are working with you as best we can to promote your book and enhance your efforts and vice versa, you know, working together, enhancing both sides. And if that made sense. <laughs> yes, it did. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think also another thing to sort of just touch on too is that that there again that local flavor mm -hmm. and you chose artists uh, who and not just the, the Ferguson artists but I'm talking about the layout of the book and all the rest of that who are here right so so Michael Kilfoy and uh, Robert O'Neill did a lot of the layout work that um, Michael Kilfoy also did some of the photography um, um, Ryan Archer did a lot of the photography. Mm -hmm. uh, everything was local. The printers were local, et cetera. And uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Jaffe Books because mm -hmm. um, they have been also very instrumental in working with me. And they're getting to be quite a big deal in the publishing business on a national level. Good for them. So um, it's really nice to you be a the part of their stable. Midas touch then, Carol. Yeah, or magic it. touch. Yeah. The magic touch. Yeah. There we go. So um, again, you know, I think for me, it's just what you shine your light on. And the other thing that I th felt was really important is there was some amazing art in this in in this effort, oh, and I yes. didn't want it to get lost. And what I could control was photographs, but my you know big, my big hairy audacious goal was to have the art really be seen. And last September October, Coca stepped forward with the support of Regions Bank and. We put on an art exhibit at six locations, uh, COCA, Missouri History Museum, UMSL, Urban League, Sheldon, and also the Ferguson Youth Initiative. And that was really something. It was funny because one of the artists came in, A.J. Rosenberg, and she did a beautiful um, piece dove that has oh. words that she wants to um, share with the sort of universe and with the community. And she saw it at the Sheldon, and she said, it's so much bigger. Did you do something to it? <laughs> <laughs> but it was just displayed in such a way. That well, because you think about it, yeah. pane glass windows are large. Yes, you they know? are. And so when you're on a building and you're painting, it looks, you know, okay, something that big looks relatively small. Right. right. But when you put it in a gallery with a light on it, it suddenly becomes very big. Yes, indeed. It's and all that perspective. Right. Now, as this, even though this started locally, you have been the recipient of many awards. Right. And some national recognition from this. Would you elaborate on all that? 
Well, I, again, I just really feel blessed, and, and I, I think, as you said, people are really reacting to the story of, of our community because it's so different from what they heard on CNN mm -hmm. and everything else. Um, so it was originally selected, I think the biggest award that it's got the seal for is the Independent Publisher Outstanding Book of the Year Peacemaker. in 2014. Mm. And then um, it was also selected in 2015 to be... Uh, represent Missouri, is that the one? Yep. Yeah, to represent Missouri at the... Library of Congress's... National Book Festival. Thank you. <gasps> well, between really? the two of us, we got that. <laughs> that was a nice, that yeah, was that nice was back switch and off forth. there. I we like practiced that. that. Yeah. <laughs> The message got across that was all that's important. So it was at the Library of Congress. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, they have a, a, a big national book festival, and each state gets to select one title. And this was the chosen. title that was selected. Yeah. You went out there, right? Yeah. Was yeah. It, what was it? Um, now I'm jumping in, but I love hearing your story about being out there Please, and, and seeing everything. Well, again, I mean, people, and again, I, I have to give a shout out to teachers because they really needed this is this is not just a ferguson issue it's not just a st louis issue as i like to say ferguson became the poster child for an, a disease that's nationwide mm -hmm. oh, and so um so other teachers etc were coming to the book festival and they were like oh my gosh i've got to have i mean we sold out in almost no time but luckily luckily through amphora i have distribution <laughs> <laughs> other places so they can get it but um you know, teachers have really been using this as a as a tool in their classroom. We have a art teacher in uh, Oregon. I was like, oh, an art teacher in Oregon. And it was Illinois, but it's still another state. <laughs> <laughs> it's another state. That's right. <laughs> but uh, he did a whole project at the beginning of the school year. This was like their their to kick off the school year project, where every child did a painting inspired by these paintings that became a mural that was up in the school for the whole year. Fabulous. We've had other, I've been to dozens of schools locally and I'm happy to do school visits. Um, and uh, one of the art teachers also had the kids doing murals and they, they really get into expressing their point of view through through this art. Yes. And and how wonderful for them to to learn from it and embrace it, and they didn't have to go through quite the the trauma, you know, that the people in Ferguson did. Well, but that see, they're that's learning a, from it. Still. And that's the thing, you know. I mean, people. One of the reasons I chose to do a children's book because people might think, well, why didn't you just do a nice coffee table book? One of the reasons was um, having been from Ferguson, graduating from McClure High School. You know, I knew the community, and I was hearing that a lot of parents were frustrated because nobody was talking to the kids. Oh. And it really depended on the almost the building. It really depended on the principal. Some some schools were, um, but others were uncomfortable. And I think it was because they lacked a tool. Mm -hmm. And what this became, not really by design, I won't take credit for that, but by happenstance, was a tool for teachers to use to begin the conversation yeah. about racial equity, about supporting each other, about coming together, you know, despite our our di uh, differences. And when we do make that reach one step outside of our comfort zone, the amazing things that happen. Indeed. Indeed. Well, this is just a tremendous book. Painting for Peace in Ferguson is the name of this book. And, of course, published by Amphora Publishing. And um, how do people get this? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Anywhere Everywhere. books are sold. Are sold. That's, That's, right. Right. Books books are sold. That's right. Anywhere books are sold. <laughs> Dick -dun -dun. <laughs> but, I, you know, I do like to give a shout-out to Left Bank Books yes. and... Um, some of the other stores, Barnes and Noble in Ladue has been very supportive mm -hmm. as well. Uh, the Book House in Maplewood. There's been a lot of that I've worked with pretty closely. Actually, I want to jump on that too because I, I was a little flippant in my response, and I'm glad that you brought that up. The local booksellers have been absolutely fabulous partners in this, yeah. and I and I'm glad you said it. And I shouldn't have been so flippant earlier because that's really where it starts. It's, absolutely, it's, yeah. That's how the groundswell happened. Yeah, and that's what a what a wonderful 
uh, momentum behind you. Yes, right. And that has led to other things, too. I'm sitting here holding now a coloring book that's a sequel along with special colored pencils. Well, those that's a special gift just for you. Just a special. (laughs) Oh, moi. The pencils are are from Crayola. Okay. All righty. But the Painting for Peace, a coloring book, and it's for all ages. So about a year later, um, again, I, I really thought, a lot of people wanted ways to interact, and I was using coloring pages just when I was doing author appearances and stuff, and those were being those were very popular. And I thought, well, with the coloring craze going on right now, I thought it might make sense. And again, I have to give a shout out to um, Barnes and Noble Adieu because it was really their idea, Tremendous. Uh, Megan, at at their store, yeah. and she said, you know, there's very few books that are both for children and adults. And this is really set up for, you know, maybe a grandparent to do with a child. So there's a range of of um, art that is it. But it's all the art is based on the art that was done in just a matter of days on the boards outside in the cold over Thanksgiving weekend. And what's fun about it is um, kids can do some pages like a connect the dot. Others are more elaborate for adults, but it allows you to interact with the art in a different way. Yeah. It's one thing to see a tiny picture in a book. It's another to really get into the details. And I think it's so important. One of the pieces we have in there is the black and white hands oh, of the arch. The arch. Yes. And that was a piece that Anna Bonfia did. Um, her brother Gabe was also one of the artists that was involved. Uh, but. When I talk to children when I go into schools and I ask them to look at this painting because it's hard to see over the radio, so I'll describe it. And one side has a white leg of the arch that it then sort of transforms into a hand that is grasping another hand that is a black hand that represents the other leg of the arch. And at the bottom of the arch are roots. Yes. But in the original painting, it's also kind of floating in the sky. So there's a lot going on there. And when I go, and even young kids, you know, I start to talk to them. Well, what do you see here? Oh, it's the arch, right? What else? Oh, it's hands, right? What else? It's a black and white hand, right? What else? And I say, what about these roots? Mm -hmm. I said, now, when you go down to the arch, you don't see the roots. Why do you think the artist put those in? And so it's very interesting to see the little wheels starting to turn and starting to think, well, why did she put this in, and what does this mean, and why is it floating? And um, there have been all kinds of answers, like we're rooted here, this is our home, we have to grow together. Um, But her actual intention originally was um, we all felt very uprooted at the time. But then in order to get to a better place, we have to uproot ourselves and move to a better place. So, you know, again, it's it's kind of gives you chills when you when you think about in a short amount of time the thinking that's behind a lot of this art. Yes. So that's why I'm really excited that, you know, the art is getting seen and I've got my fingers crossed that we might be able to have it at the Urban League National Convention the last week in July. I think it's the 25th, 26th around there. Um, we're hoping we can gather as many of the pieces that still exist as possible and do a big exhibit at the convention center that could be open to the public. I think that would be just tremendous. Now, where are they right now? Where are all these panels? We've got, we made special, um, well, actually, I worked with COCA, but really I went up to Ferguson, talked to people that I knew that still had panels. Um, a lot were lost, mm. but... Um, because again, nobody, these businesses were thinking about getting back open. Sure, you know that's where sure. that had to be their priority. Um, but of the ones I've been, we've been able to gather. We put in a storage place in the city, and we designed careful racks for them so they won't warp or anything yeah. like that. How great! And what a wonderful thing for you, you know. There again, that's preserving something that's a moment in history too. Right. I mean, there's 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 truly a, a 
Well, it's, value take, it's to taken this. some good partners. So Regional Arts Commission has several of the pieces good. in as their permanent collection, and they've allowed us to borrow them. Missouri History Museum has several of the pieces, which they've allowed us to borrow, um, and we've kind of just been borrowing, gathering. Some have not been claimed. One of the more mm. compelling pieces, which is of a African American boy done in spray paint that was at the Sheldon, very colorful. It's just a layering on of paint. Yeah. Um, His face looking out through the paint. We never found out I've who the him. artist was, so really? we still don't know. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. But there's so many stories, and in the back of the uh, the coloring book, because I enjoy telling stories, I wanted to be sure to include those stories of the artists so that that's a fun thing to do to read together with children also. Oh, it is. And there's some wonderful, wonderful statements in here. I'm just at the back page. A dragon teaches you that if you want to climb high, you have to do it against the wind. <laughs> it's a Chinese proverb. That's wonderful. wonderful. And wonderful. that on the flip side of that, this is a little bookmark on the flip side of that, is one of the a painting of a dragon oh, that yes. was on a Chinese restaurant up in Ferguson. So this family uh, went and did that painting. And, you know, of course, the dragon is very important in Chinese culture. So they Indeed. chose a dragon to be part of their painting. Oh my. And there's a lot of themes that I ask the children to look for in the book, too. I mean, so there's a number of phoenixes. I ask them to count how many arches there are, you know, how many doves. Even the dove that's in the cover page um, is holding uh, an olive branch, and I talk to the kids, how many symbols do you see? Because mm -hmm. I said that's the great thing about art, is you can, you can see things, you can say things in art through symbols without needing to use words. You certainly can. Well, you have just given our world a wonderful gift here. And um, what what other things are on your drawing board now? Was this your first book? I never asked you that. It technically <laughs> yes was my f first book. I wow I've collaborated like on, it out of the park. <laughs> I've collaborated yes. on some other other things. I've been a writer all my life, mm -hmm. you know, and I've I've worked um, either in journalism itself or uh, marketing. So I know a good story when I see it. But but again, the the motivation was really. How can this wonderful moment where the community did come together be used to benefit the community further? And that was, that was the impetus behind the book. And as you mentioned before, the proceeds, the, the profits are going to Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah, we've, we've been able to support uh, the Ferguson Youth Initiative. We've been able to support the Northern Arts Council, which is an arts group dedicated to bringing more arts and art activities to North County. Uh, we've been able to support schools and some small businesses, the I Love Ferguson Committee, which then gives it to some of the small businesses up there. And uh, we also got a grant which allowed us to give more than 600 books to the Ferguson Florissant School District. I was going to ask you about that. So every library, every classroom that wanted one has a book. Tremendous. Tremendous. And what else is on your drawing board now? Well, I don't know. I'm noodling around with some ideas. <laughs> um, you know, I, again, I, I sort of the most immediate is this, uh, hopefully this art exhibit at the convention center with the Urban League convention comes oh, to town. Oh, that would be tremendous. And how about um, for a publishing? Um, what is, what's on your upcoming getting docket? Getting bigger. Getting That's bigger. Great. That's and always on our plate. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos and accolades not only for this book, but for the fact that you are getting bigger and growing stronger. <laughs> thank you. I just and, and thank you for allowing us, allowing me and Carol the opportunity to, to talk to you and talk to your listeners today. I did want to do a, a quick, just little commercial, sure, if I could. Absolutely. Um, this summer, we're really focusing in on our series and. Uh, series that we have in Amphora. Um, Cynthia Graham is a local writer. She uh, is writing the Cherokee Crossing series. We've got two books of hers already out. Um, Beneath Still Waters, uh, Behind Every Door, and coming up soon is Behind the Lies. So that's up. That's that's coming coming to a bookstore uh, uh, soon. Uh, Steve Weinstein uh, is doing the Daybreak series. He's in Columbia, but still a local local writer. He's got This Old World, Slant of Light, and we're going to be soon publishing. I think in September, uh, Language of Trees. 
And then we've got Kevin Colleen, local uh-huh. radio personality, yes. um, with his Cantwell series. He's got Never Hug a Nun, Try to Kiss a Girl, <laughs> uh, Snow Globes and Hand Grenades, and we're coming out with the fourth in that series, um, uh, September, I think, October. I'll have to go ahead and check that again. But uh, coming again to a bookstore near you, uh, Most Improved Sophomore. And very soon, we hope, we hope, we hope, uh, uh, the wheels are in motion for this to start what's called a literary feast, where we're going to promote authors and have dinner and drinks and a nice book discussion uh, with folks. So, uh, What a great um, idea. Stand by for more details on that one. I'm really excited about the literary oh, feast. Gosh, that sounds great, Lisa. So I'm going to ask you a question. How many titles do you have now? Uh, 46 or Bravo. more, yeah, yeah. something oh, like that. Oh, that's great. That um, is great. In comparing it to, uh, as we do our business development, we compare ourselves, you know, with other publishers of the same size and whatever. And I, I ran across this quote where somebody said something like, you know, when we had scheduled to do, you know, six books for that year and, you know, how kinds, what kinds of crazy was that? I'm thinking... Geez, you know, we're, we're publishing 10 to 14 titles in a year. Uh, um, so, and quality books. And that, that's what's, I'm so impressed with, with, with uh, Donna Esner, our acquisitions editor, and, and Christy McKenzie, our, our uh, managing editor, uh, for finding books of just the highest caliber and being able to do, take what's already good and make it even better. So they're incredibly yes. impressive. And, and um, I think the, um, the awards for the books that are being produced um, are a testament to that. Well, and if, if our listeners want to hear more about this, and I think you're right, that is a testament to it, that you our listeners can go to Amphora Publishing, and that's spelled A-M, like Michael, P-H-O-R-A-E. That's mm-hmm. the yes. plural of it. Yes. Amphorapublishing.com. Thank you. And do you have a website for your book? Yes, uh, paintingforpeace.com. Well, that's easy enough. Or paintingforpeacebook.com, sorry. It's paintingforpeacebook.com. Yeah. And there you can also find the coloring book, I'm sure. Right. Excellent. Yes, absolutely. And there's a lot of teacher's resources there for free Great. on the website, and there's some coloring pages to download for free. Um, really tried to put together, and this is a, a core curriculum aligned teacher's guide Super. for elementary uh, school teachers. So. Over the summer, teachers, you can look at that for next yeah, fall. <laughs> absolutely, and digest it. And, you know, I think that's, that's really important because every teacher out there is always thinking, how can we do better? How, what, can we, what else can we incorporate? You know, and they're always looking for a new opportunity. What a delight to have you both here again. Uh, you again, I should say, Lisa, Lisa Miller, and uh, publisher and the the spokesperson, perhaps, the mouthpiece for I M4A. can be the mouthpiece. That's fine. <laughs> That'll be my part to and play. <laughs> that's it. And this, that's what my husband says. What does your wife do for a living? Oh, she runs her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> like it. <laughs> Nothing like love. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and then we also have the author, Carol Swarthout Klein. What a delight to meet you today and to learn the, the backstory on this marvelous book. Well, thank you. Thank you. And again, if people want to sort of follow us, we have a Facebook page as well, Painting for Peace book, and on Facebook. And we are trying to promote, you know, issues of diversity and um, art and art and healing. And so, you know, we post a lot of interesting things on there if you want to follow us there as well. Fantastic. And for our playout music today, I chose a piece by a woman composer. Her name is Clarice Assad. She's from Brazil, and her uncles are pretty well known in the guitar world. Their names are Sergio and Adair Assad. Her whole family is musical, so she comes by her composing naturally. You know, she, she comes by it honestly. And this is the first movement from her Impressions Suite, with Nadia Salerno Sonnenberg conducting and the New Century Chamber Orchestra.